In the age of the mid-90s, 3D game development was unformed, shrouded by technical limitations. But then, there was the PlayStation, and with the PlayStation came a new competitor. With the strength of Crash Bandicoot, it challenged the old guard. Crash's mighty woes peeled apart their stone scales. The dragon Spyro weaved great feist. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> Everybody has a first video game, the experience which initially introduced them to the realm of interactive entertainment. For older gamers, it may have been Super Mario Bros., Space Invaders, or Mega Man. For teenagers of today, it could very well be relatively newish titles like Call of Duty 4 or even the likes of Wii Sports. But for me, my first time holding a controller came in 1999 when I played Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back on the original PlayStation, and I haven't stopped gaming since. The Crash Bandicoot series is very special to me, alongside the likes of Ratchet & Clank, the 3D Super Mario games, Smash, Pokemon, and Grand Theft Auto. While my gaming preferences have evolved over the years, I still hold these games and others of the same console generations in high regard for the simple fact that I thoroughly enjoyed them as a child. Some people like to act as though memories forged on video games don't count, but they absolutely Absolutely do. I'll never forget that immeasurable feeling of awe as I embarked on an epic space adventure in Ratchet and Clank 3, or my first time beating the Elite Four in Pokemon Sapphire, or going over to my friends' houses to play nothing but Halo 3 multiplayer all day. I've stated on numerous occasions in the past that Crash Bandicoot 2 and 3 are among my favorite video games. I'm not saying that hyperbolically, I mean they're in my top five. This isn't to suggest that they're the best games ever made, because I can wholeheartedly admit that there are better games than the OG Crash Bandicoot titles. But even separating my own personal biases, I still believe for a long time that the original five PlayStation Crash titles are great games today, not just great for their time. But just how well have these games held up 20 years removed from their original releases? For a very long time, I've been keen on re-examining the original Crash Bandicoot trilogy, not only for a healthy dose of nostalgia, but also because I was interested in determining why we all enjoy these games so much, and perhaps to discover some flaws that we may sometimes overlook. It's difficult to try and critically examine a property you personally have an attachment to, but I think the risk is worth the reward of experiencing these games again. It seems fitting to begin with the one that started it all. <laughs> The year is 1996, Sony's first video game console, the result of a failed joint venture with Nintendo to develop the SNES CD, released one year ago in Western markets. The console got off to a good start, selling several million units and sporting a rather high game attachment rate. While the PlayStation was performing surprisingly well, the console landscape of the mid-90s was extremely competitive. Sony not only had to compete with the Sega Saturn and the soon-to-be-released N64, but also the SNES and Sega Genesis, which were still at consistently outselling the PlayStation during its early days. The contributing factors were numerous and no single cause could be identified as the sole explanation. But there was one thing Sony lacked that both Nintendo and Sega had, a mascot. Seeing as Nintendo had Mario and Sega had Sonic, it only seemed fitting that the PlayStation had its own mascot, one with enough appeal to push the PlayStation into the hands of early adopters. And thus, Crash Bandicoot was born, a character created to assume the role of PlayStation's tentpole mascot. Andy Gavin, the creator of the series, has expressly stated as much in the past. Yes, there was also Spyro, but his debut came in 1998, the same year that Warped was released. During the console's early years, Crash was the mascot. Even though his conception was influenced by outside factors such as the existence of Mario and Sonic, in my humble opinion, Crash ended up becoming the most unique mascot of the three. Yeah, we all like Mario, but personally, Personality-wise, he's about as dynamic as a cinder block. Sonic, I liked before he could speak, but then for a period of 12 years, he was an insufferable twat before Roger Craig Smith took over the role and he became likable and charismatic again. I'm sure some people liked Sonic as a character during the 2000s, but these are usually the same people who think Sonic Adventure 2 has a good story, so it's okay to disregard their opinions. Crash, on the other hand, was goofy, strange, emotive, and remarkably endearing. You can't really bring yourself to dislike such an innocent 
arrogant goofball, and his unconventional design and personality distinguishes him from other mascot characters and gives him an edge on current PlayStation mainstays like Kratos, otherwise known as the God of the Planks of Wood. Subsequent PlayStation icons such as Ratchet and Sly Cooper are certainly favorites of mine, but I think even now, after all this time, Crash is still viewed as a PlayStation mascot, despite the fact that most installments in his series are multi-platform games and have been since 2001. His history with the PlayStation is simply inextricable. That's where he started, and that's where he'll be remembered. Most fifth generation games look bad. Am I wrong on this? I mean, am I am I being unfair? Because I don't think I am when I make that statement as blanket as it sounds. All early works utilizing brand new technology struggle to weather the cruel mistress that is time. Much like the world's first photograph is completely incomprehensible, blurry, and shit, early 3D video games simply look crappy because the plane of existence we inhabit and are used to seeing isn't jaggy and undetailed. The technology is simply improved to such a degree that older games can't hold up unless they feature a particularly distinct art style. It's the reason why Wind Waker looks so great while other games of the same year look like crap. Unlike 16-bit video games such as Super Metroid and Sonic the Hedgehog which have aged wonderfully and still remain vibrant and detailed, I can only think of a handful of PlayStation 1 and Nintendo 64 games I still consider visually appealing. There's Oddworld, uh, Star Fox 64, Banjo-Kazooie, and... The Crash games. See, what I did there was lead you to believe my opinion was negative, and then I subverted your expectations with that perfectly timed transition, which I totally didn't spend way too much time trying to write. Well, on my way to getting the Oscar for Best Original Video Script, I mean, in a world where fucking Suicide Squad is an Academy Award winning film, anything is in the realm of possibilities. I honestly think that the PlayStation 1 Crash games, including the original, look quite good, and that's mostly due to rather excellent animation. The sequels were certainly improved in this regard, but even here, Crash still moves and emotes with a good degree of fidelity. The vibrancy of the environments, especially the foliage, aids in making the game visually pleasant. The music of Crash 1 is also good, though not nearly as high quality as the soundtracks of the subsequent games. This is something I plan to address far more thoroughly in the following critiques, but by comparison to Crash 2 and 3, OG Crash's soundtrack is somewhat... Hollow, if that makes sense. It's very much lacking the energy of the soundtrack so prominently featured in the sequels. The soundtracks of 2 and 3 are generally higher tempo, often crescendo and evolve over their length, and feature a greater number of bass instruments and sounds, which I think distinguishes Crash music from other games. Don't get me wrong, Insanity Beach? Great, wonderful song. Most of the other stuff, not so much. It's really difficult to explain, but I think you can tell when a piece of music is lacking something. It feels as though there are too many instances where the sound isn't solid enough, or it's missing a specific rhythm. I think the best way to illustrate my point would be to play a little game of compare and contrast. The identity and style of Crash Bandicoot changed significantly between the first two games, with Cortex Strikes Back and Warp distinguishing themselves from the Pacific Island motif and embracing more of a science fiction aesthetic. I'll touch on it more in the Crash 2 critique, but I will say that I personally prefer this change. Crash 1 is quite consistent in setting, but that's also somewhat limiting as basically every environment until the third island is very similar. They're all tropical environments, which can get very boring after a few hours. This doesn't even make any sense. Crash is an eastern barred Bandicoot, which is native to Tasmania, an island to be sure, but also a really cold one. But I guess I shouldn't concern myself with realism in a game where you play as a bipedal bandicoot battling against a dude with the letter N super glue to his forehead. Crash Bandicoot is a platformer. Your objective is to reach the end of the level without falling into bottomless pits or being killed by enemies. Groundbreaking stuff, I know. Any game can be boiled down to its base mechanics in a simplistic way, and most of the time, it's kind of an unfair assessment, but in the case of Crash Bandicoot, I don't think it is. That is an accurate summary of the game. It's a linear platformer and nothing else. I don't think this is a bad thing in and of itself. The word linear has always evoked a visceral reaction from gamers, but the fact of the matter is that linear game design is just 
just as legitimate as any other form of game design. We only think it sucks because a lot of games which strive to be linear are poorly executed. For instance, Super Mario 3D World is a linear platformer and yet it is great for that very reason. It's focused, tightly designed, polished and brimming with content. Conversely, Call of Duty Ghost fucking sucks because it's a railroading restrictive experience designed to trick the player into thinking they're awesome when in reality it's all about as complex as a game of duck duck goose. With Crash Bandicoot, I'm willing to be lenient on its shortcomings by comparison to more recent releases because it was such an early 3D platformer. It doesn't feature a diverse array of unique challenges that aren't repeated throughout the game, and it doesn't demand any level of exploration or creative thinking on the part of the player. It's a straightforward platformer, which is all it needed to be. It's go I'm gonna sound a bit negative for a while, but it must be said that, at its core, Crash Bandicoot is a very fun platformer. It's challenging, demands the player to react quickly, and is well paced throughout. The game provides an extremely pure platforming experience, and I think that kind of game design is timeless and endlessly enjoyable. The Crash series is a linear platforming series, and Crash 1 in particular is as straightforward as they come. But as a result, Crash Bandicoot 1 ends up lacking the dynamism and range of other 3D platformers. The the challenges in every level are always the same. Time your jumps, avoid obstacles, observe and exploit patterns in the level hazards, don't fall to your death. That's every level in a nutshell. The game occasionally changes up the formula with different scenarios such as the iconic boulder dash and the occasional hog riding level, but those are the only such instances. The frequent reuse of levels doesn't serve to alleviate this problem either. Again, to be fair, Crash 2 and 3 also reuse environments and build their challenges in similar ways, but as I intend to get into with a subsequent critiques of those games, Crash 2 and 3 simply have more meat to them. The controls of Crash 1 are undeniably wonky and stiff, and I think after extensive play, I've identified the source of the problem. If you're moving even slightly, executing a spin will cause Crash to gain speed instantaneously, which is bound to throw you off on occasion. Manipulating Crash is also finicky, as minor movements are often difficult to execute, simply because of the way he gains speed. If you're stationary and you attempt to move only a little bit, either you won't move at all, or in the far more likely case, will overshoot jumps or accidentally walk off a platform. Adding further insult to injury, Crash's moveset in this game is simplistic in contrast to not only Crash 2 and 3, but other 3D platformers of the era. Crash can run, jump, and spin. That's it. By comparison, in Super Mario 64, the player can run, jump, somersault, long jump, triple jump, slide, backflip, ground pound, and swim. Not every game requires a lengthy moveset, but the addition of the sliding ground pound in Crash 2 were undeniably good changes. However, for the most part, the Crash games simply aren't structured in such a way where a huge list of moves such as a long jump would be particularly beneficial. It's, it, it just isn't congruent with the level design. And this brings us to what may well be the game's greatest success. There were not many 3D platformers before Crash Bandicoot. Up until about a few years earlier, video game development had always been strictly 2D on consoles, and the transition to 3D presented a lot of challenges for developers because 2D and 3D games are nothing alike. The games now need real camera systems, movement is no longer restricted to two directions, and levels need to be designed with three dimensions in mind. For such an early 3D game, I think Naughty Dog's solution to this barrier presented in creating a platformer in a 3D perspective was very ingenious. Crash Bandicoot uses a locked camera, which the player cannot manipulate in any way. It's either locked behind Crash above him or to the side in the traditional 2D levels. In stark contrast, Super Mario 64 features a free moving camera of sorts the player can manipulate, though I use the word loosely since the camera is about as reliable as Windows Vista. Of course, the locked camera only works when the levels are designed to be narrow in scope and linear, which really shows the difference between the two games in terms of design and ambition. Crash Bandicoot is a 2D platformer framed from a 3D perspective, whereas Super Mario 64 is a 3D platformer. You're probably thinking that sounds stupid, right? But what I mean to say is that in terms of the design philosophy, Mario 64 is about exploring 3D spaces freely and navigating challenges built around perception. The challenge is really about simply jumping over something directly in front or to the side of you. Crash Bandicoot, while containing 3D platforming challenges, often features levels framed from a 2D perspective and all of the levels are intricately scripted in that there's usually only one way of getting around. You're always running forward, just like how in 2D platformers, you're always moving to the right of the screen. Crash Bandicoot adheres more strongly to the pervasive platforming design philosophy of the day while Super Mario 64 innovated. It's for this reason that Super Mario 64 is the more revolutionary of the two games, and I would say that it's much better than the first Crash Bandicoot. But with 
that also came more exacerbated growing pains and missteps. Crash Bandicoot 1 is more consistent than Super Mario 64. It's all good, but nothing really reaches the heights of Mario's first 3D adventure. That's not to say that there isn't some nonsense in the OG Crash game. It's almost funny how brutal this game is at times. I mean, the save system is bonkers. You can't save whenever you want, but there also aren't any set save points on each island like you would see in Super Mario World. You can only save by completing bonus stages. If you fail that bonus stage, you don't get to save, meaning that's another level you have to replay if you end up losing all your lives. Some of the levels in this game are bad, outright. I mean, fuck the Lost City and Sunset Vista 2. Those levels suck. Fumbling in the dark, great concept, wonky execution. Sometimes by spinning enemies, Aku Aku masks located further along the stage are activated, meaning that you're screwed because you're no longer able to reach the light distance with enough light to see what you're doing. The high road will crush your balls. That level is hard. And the stupid hogs with generous hitboxes that roam across the bridge are likely to send some controllers flying. They're especially annoying when you're chasing gems. Speaking of, I must admit, collecting gems in Crash 1 really tested my patience. This is by far the hardest of the three games with regards to collecting gems because you must complete each level without losing a life. You die, you restart. No second chances to be found here. You guys know me, I enjoy a good challenge and there is catharsis to be found in finally acquiring a gem on a particularly difficult stage but Christ does the game go out of its way to make the whole ordeal unnecessarily aggravating. First off, you have to manually back out of every level and reload it to make another attempt, which is really fucking annoying after a while. Much of the frustration would have been alleviated if there was an option during the level select screen to set it on gem mode or something, so that if you die, the checkpoints are ignored and you just start at the beginning. Simple convenient solution. In Crash 2 and 3, at the end of each level, a rather helpful counter will inform the player of how many crates they've broken out of the total number of crates in the level. In fact, Warped goes above and beyond by displaying that counter every time you press the triangle button. If the level allows for backtracking, you know in advance of finishing the stage that there are crates you missed which you can go back and try to find. You would be surprised how much of a kick to the testes it is to discover that you missed 15 crates you didn't know about until you already completed the level under the assumption that you were done, thereby forcing you to load out of the level, load back in, and do it all over again. Something I forgot about the original Crash game as well was the fact that you need to acquire specific color gems on later levels to fully complete earlier levels. For instance, you can't get the white gem on the Great Gate unless you've already unlocked the yellow gem acquired in the lab, the second last level of the game. If you don't know this, which is highly likely for a first time player, you'll be running around in circles. Now Crash 2 does the same thing, but it's very clearly telegraphed on the pause menu and in each warp room that there are colored gems you need to acquire. Crash 1 does a much worse job of communicating this to the player. Gems represent the ultimate difficulty spike in Crash Bandicoot and provide a great deal of replay value despite the problems with their implementation in this installment of the series. You're forced to become extremely well acclimated with each level and it really does test your skills. It, it honestly does. It was, a, it was a surprising challenge going back through to try and get a whole bunch of gems. Crash Bandicoot is not a long game. You can beat it in an afternoon, but in my opinion, the real meat of the game is getting gems. It's the ultimate challenge and the reason you'll be replaying every level at least a few times in the same way that one replays Sonic levels to get faster times. If you're like me and you enjoy platformers for the challenge they provide, Crash Bandicoot will always be fun, but at the same time, time it's difficult to return to after playing Crash 2 and 3. I would recommend starting with 1 if you've never played them before, enjoying the game on its own terms, and then moving on to 2 and 3 because they're quite literally better in almost every way. I hope you'll forgive the pun, because I couldn't resist, but Crash Bandicoot really is an unpolished gem. It's a game that was largely successful in its goals and it laid a solid foundation for the sequels to follow. Not only that, but the game introduced an immediately likable character and a world that, while loose and somewhat inconsistent, had room to grow. For a first attempt, Naughty Dog got a lot of things right. It is quite a good game. But of all the OG PlayStation Crash games, including CTR and arguably Crash Bash, Crash 1 is the weakest. It's unrefined, the controls 
controls are stiff, Crash's movement is startlingly limited, and the level design doesn't offer the variety that one should expect from a platformer, both in terms of unique gimmicks and varied environments. After the sequel, Spyro, and perhaps more aptly Super Mario 64, the game comes across as focused to a fault, and certain design choices were outright misguided. All of that said, 22 years later, if you're looking for a bit of simple platforming fun, the original Crash Bandicoot is still a good time. Thank you.